نحمد و نسلی علی رسول الکریم اما آباد دیا ویورز السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ وی ہیو دا پلیجر آف ہیونگ ڈاکٹر بلال فلپس وت اس ڈاکٹر بلال السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وعلیکم السلام و رحمۃ اللہ اٹس مائی پلیجر ٹو بی وت یو جزاک ٹوڈے ویل بی ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ سم آف دا کامن کویشچنز دیٹ نان مسلمس آسک اس ان اور دعوا ایکسپیرینسز سم آف دا کویشچنز دیٹ دے کم اکراس ان دیز ٹائمز when jihad and terrorism is the buzzword do you think these two concepts or these two ideas are one and the same of course they're not uh, terrorism uh, of course even terrorism itself has its own complexities you know as we say one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter mm-hmm. you know and if we use the definitions of terrorism which were put out by you know certain governments it would include the american revolution the french revolution and you know all the major revolts that ended up in establishing democracy and things like this in other countries so uh, the whole issue of terrorism is something quite relative anyway and jihad again is something else uh, though people who may be involved in what we could agree on as acts of terrorism may use the term jihad to justify it that doesn't make it jihad in and of itself either you know whereas jihad is in fact a struggle a struggle against evil whether it is with an individual or within his family his community or it could be a state struggling against evil the evil of another state and it may involve arms it may involve writing it may involve speaking etc so uh, jihad has many many facets to it So it's really unfair and and incorrect you know for the media to mix these two terms together and create a kind of a hodgepodge idea of you know terrorist jihad is you know kind of um, mix how can a person i clearly identify that what is jihad and what is a clear act of terrorism how do you know that in a particular area what is going on Well sometimes it may not be possible you know because from a distance if you are not in control of the media uh others are are creating the news then you are subject to whatever image that they portray but if a person does have access to actual information about what is going on then we can say that some acts uh of uh terrorism which involve uh killing of innocents you know people who are not involved in any kind of military struggle um children women etc you know uh blowing them up you know murdering them as a means of terrorizing a society i mean these are acts which islam doesn't condone under any label jihad is something that muslims are enjoined to undertake where the need arises it is not the title for any struggle uh we have no holy wars we have just and unjust struggles a just struggle which may involve military means etc where the struggle is for the sake of god for the sake of allah you know that can be defined as jihad uh, or an aspect of jihad whereas fights struggles etc which are for nationalist tribalist political uh interests which have nothing to do with islam uh though they may be labeled as jihad struggles or jihadist struggles the people involved are called jihadists uh, this is not from the islamic perspective jihad now the media creates images and it seems muslims are losing this war against the media what do you think is the solution to this problem that we are in well the only way around this is for muslims to develop independent media you know channels like al jazeera and others that are coming up now where the other side of the picture is being presented to certain degrees i mean this is what needs to be done muslims should have had satellite stations you know decades ago which would express and to uh, would explain what their positions are what their struggles are involved in etc but as long as the media doesn't 
remain in our hands or doesn't get into our hands. We don't take an active part in utilizing the media to portray our own causes. Then we will always be subject to the, you know, the whims of Western or Eastern or you know, non-Muslim media. As you are aware, Sheikh, that a lot of our programs are telecast on the satellite channels, and we know the cost involved in setting up a channel. We've been trying to do that. Now, it's a huge cost. What message would you like to give to the Muslim brothers and sisters around the world as far as their responsibility towards setting up an, a good Islamic channel? Well, as I said, it is something which should have been done decades ago. And really, there should be positive support for all such efforts. And whether it's with the IRF efforts, there are other efforts being done elsewhere in the UK. There is Islam Channel and, and uh, in the US and Canada and other parts of the Muslim world now. People are becoming more and more aware of the need to develop our own expressions, uh, channels of expression through the media. And um, it is our duty really to, to be actively involved in such um, efforts because of the fact that our future and our, our cause and our existence to a large degree depends on being able to accurately present the picture of Islam uh, its teachings, its aspirations, you know, so that people will understand that Islam is not a threat. Actually, Islam has the solution, the solution that people are, are looking for all over the world to many of the problems uh, that they currently face. It is not a threat, you know, as you know, the media tends to portray it as this has now replaced communism, as communism was a threat back in the 50s and 60s. Now this has now been replaced by Islam. This is the next threat, you know. And even surveys done in, in uh, places like the U.S. Uh, show that the majority of the population feel that, um, yes, Muslim rights should be curtailed. You know, things like this, which is, you know, shocking. We think of in a democracy where people are considering curtailing the rights of some of its citizens, you know, simply because of their religion. Uh, so uh, we do need, we have a, a great need for our own media to express the truth about Islam to the world. Talking about uh, satellite channels and so on, a lot of non-Muslims have now access to visuals of the Kaaba, the Hajj, Tawaf, Taravi and so on. And they are thrilled to see the numbers worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the holy city of Makkah. What they come back and ask us that why are only Muslims privileged to visit Makkah? Why are we not allowed to enter this holy city? How do we respond to that? Well, we clarify for them that it is not a place of tourism. You know, uh, naturally, tourist spots, everybody wants to go and visit the tourist spots. You know, the temples and the pyramids. And, and these are parts of tourism. Whereas Mecca represents a sanctuary for Islam and the worship of the one God. So those who are coming there should be coming for that same purpose. If people are coming for tourism, that is going to interfere with the religious uh, activities and the rites, etc. You know, people will not be able to perform their rites properly with people coming in and snapping shots and you know as tourists do you know which would and we know what happens to places when tourism comes there it corrupts it also you know so to keep the place clean and pure for worship then it has been restricted only to muslims and as every society and every um, organization has its own sanctuaries where only members who carry special identification or whatever allowed in, we can look at it in a similar light. Whereas mosques around the world are open. People can come and see mosques anywhere in the Muslim world. But at least we have two sanctuaries, Mecca and Medina, 
which are restricted just to Muslims to keep it free of the, a lot of the crass materialism that tends to come into places that have been designated as tourist sites. Another question right on top of the minds of non-Muslims is that Islam promotes forcible conversions. It was spread at the point of the sword and so on. How do you respond to that? Well, I think history proves otherwise. Uh, where we find that the largest Muslim country in the world today, Indonesia, with some 200 plus million Muslims, uh, never saw any Muslim soldiers. I say that speaks for itself. With the fact that Muslims ruled India for a thousand years, if it was conversion by the sword, there would not have remained a single Hindu in India. Muslims ruled Spain for 700 years. Were it conversion by the sword, there would not have remained a single Christian in, in Spain. You know, and uh, Christians have lived, and Jews and others have lived side by side with Muslims in many places, in Yemen, in, in Palestine, in North Africa, and in many, many countries. They've lived side by side without any problems, uh, without being, you know, forcibly converted. And if we consider that today in America, between three and 400 people are accepting Islam daily, according to University of Chicago, Michigan, uh, calculations of uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Iwan Haddad and Dr. Hassan Badbi, uh, they concluded that there was approximately between three and four hundred convert daily to Islam. Uh, where are the swords? You know, where are the guns and etc.? No. It is Christianity actually that uh, where the Pope about three, four years ago made a public apology to humankind for the forcible conversions uh, done, you know, back in the 15th century, 16th century, etc., when the conquistadors left Spain and, and Portugal and these areas and went out and were forcing people into the religion, you know. They have that history, but Islam doesn't have that history. From human rights, uh, let's move on to women rights in Islam. And a lot of questions are posed in terms of limited or no rights for women and so on. They say that you subjugate your women by putting them behind the wheel. How do you answer to that or how do we justify uh, the wheel and the subjugation and so on? Well, I would say briefly that uh, the veiling of women is not subjugation at all. The nuns, you know, from who are practicing traditional Catholicism who wear the veil, Nobody is forcing them to wear these veils. They have chosen to wear these veils. And uh, they will tell you that it liberates them in the same way that for the Muslim world in general, the veil liberates the woman. She is not as caught up in the fashion and, and the need to you know, beautify herself to a T every time she steps out of her house. She's free. She can get up in the morning and just cover herself and step out you know, without having to go through all of these change, changes that the fashion industry has, has enslaved her with. So she actually frees herself from that enslavement you know, with the veil. And in any case, Allah has explained in the Quran the purpose of the veil. And it's not something which Muslims have culturally pushed on the women, but it's something which God has ordained, God has prescribed. When he said, Yudnina alayhinna min jalabi bihinna, thalika adna and yu'arafna wala yudhain, that they should put their outer garments over themselves, drape it over themselves, in order to be known and not harmed. To be known, known in the sense of a chaste woman, a woman who is modest, who is not interested in the advances, flirtation, etc., which may come from males. You know, that she is a woman who only functions in an honorable manner. If a person is interested in marriage, they must go to her father or her brother, you know. They don't try to approach her directly. Just as a nun wearing her habit is known in the society, this is a person you don't approach, you know, amorously. You don't try to you know, hit on her, as we say in the West, right? She's not going to marry you, forget it, you know. So, uh, similarly, when a woman wears the veil, she's making that fashion statement. You know, as people, everybody who wears a, some kind of a dress is, is making a statement. The policeman wears his uniform, so you know who he is. You know, the engineer on the 
construction site, he has a particular uniform. You know who he is. The doctor in the hospital, he wears a uniform. You know who he is. This is to, so that he's known, right? So on one hand, it is for her to be known. On the other hand, for her not to be harmed. Because by draping garments over herself, she hides her charms, charms which are naturally attractive to males. And if uh, these are not hidden and these are exposed, then the, the consequence is that she, is, she comes under attack. And that is natural in all societies. Males, you know, um, are attracted to females. And males tend to be the aggressive ones. A woman may be attracted to a male, but he, the male doesn't have to worry about being attacked by a woman. But, uh, you know, a, a woman who, is a, who attracts a male, then she does have to worry about being attacked by a man. Because uh, we have, we've seen the rates in, in rape uh, and molestation of women rise dramatically over the last century, you know, in which women have basically been unclothed now, from the 19, early 1900s, where women around the world were covered up. Non-Muslim women were covered up. Till now, where they're virtually naked, you know, in television, in the beaches, etc. And we see a corresponding rise in rape. And even societies, you know, because some people raise objections. Look, Muslims, they want to separate the men from the women, for example. You know, in a Muslim society, you'll have a different bus for men or bus for women, or in the bus it's divided, a section for women, a section for men, separating them. Um, one could say, okay, look, Muslims, they're not giving women a chance to sit freely. But in both Bangkok and Tokyo, where people are jammed on buses, jammed into the bullet trains in Tokyo, the women complain so much that the government was forced to provide separate carriages for women, and separate ones for men in order to protect the women. So this idea of veiling and separation, this is to protect women. It is for their interest. It is not to oppress them. Because within, behind the veil, the woman is free to express herself, uh, her, her, her own interests, etc. You know, as we can see in developed uh, Muslim countries where uh, women are involved on the highest of levels within the society. You mentioned about uh, the veil helping protect the woman from rape and molestation and so on. But the psychologists say that essentially the problem in a rape is with the men rather than the woman because it's the sickness in the mind of the man which leads him to a rape. And if that sickness is there, he could even rape someone who is veiled. So how do we respond to these questions? Well, this is a theoretical point theoretical point that yes the person who has that desire regardless of the circumstance he may still commit the act but practically speaking if a woman is virtually naked in front of him his desire is now raised up far higher than a woman who's completely covered so to say that yes it's a problem with the man and we say, okay, let's just punish the men. That's not taking into account the reality that women also, depending on how they dress, encourage and increase that desire. So Islam says we must have a balanced situation here. Yes, the problem is with the men. And that's why the punishment for rape is so severe in Islam. If a person commits rape and uses a weapon, they're executed. That's a very severe punishment, you know, very severe. Your life is lost, okay? But on the other hand, it says, okay, so women, you should cover yourself so as not to incite this individual so that when this person's life is taken, it's because he has no excuse. He has no excuse, you know? So it is finding the balance. Another question that we normally face is that why is first of all polygyny allowed in Islam? If a man can have more than one wife, why cannot then a woman have more than one husband? So how do you explain the whole situation? Well, that point is, you know, usually raised by feminists. Uh, anthropologists clearly understand why this is not the case. Because anthropologists who always compare human behavior with animal behavior, we just don't find, you know, polyandry amongst in the animal kingdom because the ruling uh, figure is the male figure. 
and women and the females attach themselves to the male. So there is a natural tendency that polygamy is only found in the male, single male, multiple female format. As to single female, multiple male, this is something rare, abnormal. I mean, if we go around the world, through history, go back in ancient times, in ancient civilizations, you know, in primitive civilizations, wherever you go in the world, all you find is polygyny. Men having more than one woman. Why is that? Is it that, you know, there is this uh, unfairness everywhere? Or is it a natural consequence of the natural way and, and, and that human beings are created, that males have these tendencies, they have the strength, they have the, the authority, that that's the format it falls under. The reality is that it's natural. It's a natural tendency which God has created human beings with because of the fact that uh, he has uh, put in women certain emotions, etc. He has created a situation where their numbers outnumber the men, you know, whether it's because women live longer, men are killed in the wars, and all these other different factors. You know, the, the norm is that there is a surplus of women in society. So for a woman now to marry four men, she is not solving any problems. She's increasing the problem because she's taken four men out of circulation, right? You know, besides, you know, you have the other problems of a child naturally wanting to know who the father is, and no child will be comfortable with the idea of the mother, you know, telling him or her that your father is one of these men. I'm not sure which one. This just doesn't work, you know. And besides, you know, other, a number of other factors where a woman is pregnant and, you know, the, even from a procreational perspective, that societies that become strong are the ones that are able to procreate, increase its numbers of, you know, uh, new members, right? So if you have a woman with four men, four men can only impregnate one woman, right? But if you have a man with four women, that one man can impregnate four women. So in that one pregnancy, in, in the polyandry format, only one child is produced. In the other, four children are produced. So even from a natural selection perspective, and if we want to go from a Darwinian outlook, you know, the polygamy is going to be favored over uh, polyandry, the female with more than one male. Sheikh, the discussion is taking a very interesting turn, but we have very limited time. Inshallah, we'll take this discussion forward in the next uh, episode, inshallah. Ta'ala, we'll have to conclude this time. Jazakallahu khair wa akhir da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Nahmadu Nusalli ala Rasulihi al Kareem. Amma Abad. Dear viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We have the pleasure of having Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips again with us. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Bilal. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. In the previous episode, we had discussed a few questions normally asked by non Muslims about Islam, and we got the answers from Brother Bilal. We'll continue that, and we were discussing about the role and the rights of women in Islam. We talked about polygyny, polyandry. Can you throw some light on the fact that why the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had 11 wives when Muslims generally are allowed to have up to four wives? Well, first um, we should know that he had nine wives at one time. Right? This was the maximum number that he had at the same time. Though the number of wives he married, others some died. But um, why the number is greater for the Prophet وسلم, than others is um, due to the fact that the Prophet was given certain special dispensation due to the special role that his wives would have in conveying the life, the home life, uh, his home life, as a guide for the generations to come. One could say, well, four may do it also. Well, it's possible four may do it, but five would do it better. Six would do it even better. 
They, were, they would record a variety of different circumstances. Um, he demonstrated in his marriages uh, that it is permissible to marry your cousin, uh, that uh, to marry somebody who was divorced, somebody who was the former wife of your adopted son, uh, to marry somebody who was a former Jewess, somebody who was a former Christian, people from a variety. So his marriages demonstrated uh, what was permissible in terms of marriage, in terms of who you may marry, and also, as I said, those numbers served to preserve the story of his family life with such detail that it would become a guide for human beings until the last day of the world. So this is um, the basic reason. And um, for the average human being, four it seems to be the ideal number for a man to be able to handle, you know, based on God's knowledge, Allah's knowledge of human beings, their needs, and their abilities. Generally speaking about polygamy, can you throw some more light on what is the logic or the reason behind this permission, besides you mentioning that man can handle four, his, that's his capacity, but generally, what is the logic behind this? And it's understood under today's circumstances, and we know from the Sira as well, that there was jealousy amongst the wives of the prophets. So no woman would like to share uh, the husband. So how do you factor this emotion of the woman as well uh, when Islam permits polygamy? Well, the permission is a general permission based on the need of uh, human society. God created the society in a way that there would be a surplus of females in that society due to women living longer than men, uh, men dying in wars, uh, homicides being focused mainly among men, men killing other men, you know, and even the spread of homosexuality, which would, you know, reduce the number of available men in any given society. Uh, these factors. Allah knew, God knew before he created human society, so he created a nature for males that they would be attracted to more than one female, and nature for females that they would tend to be more attracted to a single male, you know, because these are complementary natures which are necessary for this to work. And, um, and this is something which has been in practice throughout the various eras of human beings on the earth. All of our archaeological evidence, research, etc., indicate that people practice polygamy wherever you were. You know, whatever corner of the earth you go to, whether you're in the North Pole or you're in South Africa or amongst the Aborigines of Australia, wherever you go, this was in practice. This was the norm for human society. Islam regulated it, it came and set certain limits for Max rights of people involved. It, it um, organized it. That's what Islam did. It didn't introduce it. It's a common misconception that people have that Islam has legislated polygamy whereas the rest of the world didn't know about it. It's sort of thing. But this is not the case at all. So Islam regulated polygamy to maximize the benefit and minimize the harm. As you said, the jealousy which comes, why would God, you know, prescribe or permit something which is harmful to a woman's emotions well because of the greater good that there was greater good in permitting polygamy than in restricting it and uh, restricting it meaning prohibiting it uh, that the harm which comes from its prohibition as we find in modern societies today which claim monogamy this has just led to a rise of mistresses, girlfriends, prostitution, and all the other evils, right? Whereas a society which permits it, then that is minimized. So the realities of human society is that even in the cases of countries where uh, they claim to be monogamous, and I'm, uh, statistics here in India have shown that uh, polygamy amongst Hindus to whom it is prohibited is higher than amongst Muslims for whom it is permitted. 
And it's not surprising to find that in North America, in America, in Canada, in, in uh, France, in the UK, the, the greater percentage, well over 50% of married males, are involved in extramarital relations, have had them or are currently having them, etc. So polygamy is, is really something uh, which is happening throughout the world, around the world. And even in the societies which claim to be monogamous, they're not really monogamous. And even the places where it originated, in Greece and Rome, where the law for the Greek citizen was that you could only have one wife. But yes, you could only have one wife from the free women of the society, but more than 50% of the population were slaves and you could have as many concubines as you wished. So where was the monogamy? So monogamy is really a dream. It is, a, it is something which never really existed. In fact, monogamy is more strictly practiced amongst Muslims than amongst non-Muslims. We learn from the Quran and other uh, hadith and so on that slavery, for example, you just mentioned about the Greeks and the Romans, that in Islam as well, slavery is allowed. What are the conditions in which uh, this permission has been given? Well, it is given in the case of jihad, really, where there is um, a struggle, a military struggle, and the, uh, a population has been taken captive, etc., or numbers have been taken captive of the enemy. The ruler of the Muslim state has the choice to either hold them as prisoners and ransom them, etc., or he may take them as slaves, slaves meaning that they would be integrated into the Muslim society. Because slavery in Islam, what may be called slavery, is really more akin to indentured labor than it is to slavery, as known typically in Western civilization, where the slave master was free to do anything he wished with his slave. He could maim them, you know, cut off their ears, do anything he wanted. They were his property. That's why slaves were given the name of the master, just as the chariot and the wife was given the name of the master. He was free to do anything he wished. Whereas in Islamic law, this is not the case. A slave has the right to seek personal freedom by what they call mukataba. He uh, will pay for himself and, and can liberate himself. Um, if a slave woman bears a child to her master, uh, that child is born free and she cannot be sold. Uh, the slaves, the same thing, uh, remember they cannot be killed. If they're killed, then the person who has killed them will be taken to account. Uh, they can't be forced to do crimes, you know, for the, the master, for example, you know. So, and even in the case of how they're referred, the Prophet ﷺ had forbidden that slaves be referred to as my slave, my slave girl, my slave boy, no. My young man, my young woman, this is what the Prophet ﷺ said, because the idea of slave, anyway, is limited really to God. Abdullah, we are slaves of Allah. You know, but slaves of other human beings, ultimately, no. We are put in a position of authority over others, and Islam found that system already in practice in the world, and it corrected the ills and the evils of it. And at the same time, it put in force a variety of principles to eradicate it practically in the society, whether it is from the heads of zakah, people could be freed from the zakat, the uh, essential treasury, uh, where money is collected from the rich of the society and redistributed amongst the poor. Part of that distribution is in freeing slaves in the society. Also, where people uh, break oaths and, and a variety of different uh, sins that a person may commit, the atonement for the sin involves freeing a slave, you know, where the slaves are in existence. So slavery was on the way out, really, in Muslim society, was being eradicated, but gradually, as people were integrated into the society. And we should note that the majority of Abbasid rulers, you know, the Abbasid era, after the time of the Prophet, we had the four righteous caliphs, and you had the Umayyad era, which ran for about a hundred years. Following that, you had the Abbasid era, which ran for many hundreds of years. Many of those rulers, the, the caliphs of the Abbasid eras, 
were the children of slave girls. You know, and that is something inconceivable in a slave society, of other slave societies, Rome, Greece, etc. It was inconceivable that the child of a slave could ever become the ruler of the society. Many of the leading scholars of hadith and tafsir of the Quran, etc., you know, from the early generation were freed slaves. You know, from the um, from the time of the Prophet, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, he had freed a slave that had been given to him, Zayd ibn Haritha, and had adopted him. And that tradition, you know, spread amongst Muslims that they would free their slaves, whoever came into a position of slavery. Uh, today in the world, of course, there's a lot of slavery going on. Going on right here in India, going on in, in Pakistan, going on in well, many, even in Western countries across Europe. People are sold into slavery in Brazil, in North America, so it is, it is an ongoing phenomenon, though the eye finger tends to be pointed at Muslims, but really it's going on till today, you know. And uh, Muslims' duty is to, to eradicate those forms because the way in which it's being done is illegal. You know, it is people being taken advantage of, people who are seeking jobs in different areas and being sold into slavery. You know, this is a whole other kind of circumstance. And a Muslim could not buy one of these so, quote-unquote so-called slaves and say, okay, now I have a slave, I, you know. I, no. I mean, the, those avenues today are closed. Moving on to some other issues related to women, about the equality of women as compared to men, the question always comes up, why is it that a woman always gets half uh, the inheritance as compared to that of the men? Well, first and foremost, we should point out that it's not always. You know, where somebody dies, they haven't left any father, mother, or children. They only left brothers and sisters. The brothers and sisters get equal shares. This is mentioned in the Quran itself. But yes, in a general sense, the son and daughter, mother and father, will get with the ratio of two to one for the male, you know, one for the female. But this is because of the fact that women in Muslim society are looked after. There is a male responsible for each and every woman. So when a daughter um, inherits, the son inherits a similar amount, the son also is responsible to look after his sister. He's responsible for his mother. He's responsible for his daughters. You know? So an additional amount is given to him for the additional responsibility he has of looking after the close relatives who are females in his family. So it's not an issue of uh, unfairness, but one considering the structure of the Muslim family and the Muslim society and its responsibilities. A society where men and women are responsible for themselves, then it might appear uh, unfair. Why give a man twice that of a female when the female has the same responsibilities as the male? But we have to look at it within the context of the Muslim uh, family and the Muslim society. There's another issue about witnesses, that two female witnesses are equal to one male witness. How do you justify that? Well, the Quran specifically states that this is in the case of business contracts. That you're forming, you're having a business contract, then choose two males or one male and two females. And it explains that this is in order that one of the females may remind the other in case she forgets. So Allah has identified, God has identified it as an issue of forgetfulness here, why a second female has been uh, commanded, you know. And this goes back to the nature of society and family, that the norm for human society is that the female looks after the family, she takes care of the children, and looks after the home. Whereas the man goes outside the home, he works, he is involved in business, etc., etc. That's the norm. So in, since he is the one involved in business, he more, most likely will remember numbers and you know, how much was owed and how much this was and this kind of, those type of, you know, mathematical related type issues. Whereas the woman being more familiar with the family circumstance, then it would be easier for her to forget really what was actually there. So having another woman witness the same thing would help her in case she forgot.
Now, somebody may raise the issue, well, uh, in modern society, women are out working like men. But really, this is an abnormal circumstance. In the West, in particular, in America, and in Europe, this was a product of World War I and World War II. World War I, women were forced to come out in the homes and go into the workplaces because millions of men were sent over to fight. So they needed people to work the factories to keep the factories going. After the war, most of them went back, some stayed. Then World War II came. Even more women came out again. And after the war, many of them stayed out. They were enticed by having their own monies, etc., as well as the industrialists encouraged them to stay working. Why? Because they became a means of lowering the wages of the males. Before, when there were sufficient males for the jobs, the males through unions could demand higher and higher wages. But now when you glutted the market with workers, Males didn't want to work, okay, we have females to take their place. Males will be unemployed, out of work. So you could now uh, demand, the industrialists could demand that this, the wages be lower. So it, they became a tool of the industrialists. So this abnormal circumstance developed where many, many women were now out and working in the workforce. But again, this is mainly in the big cities, etc. If you go into the countrysides in the U.S. and Canada and UK and France, etc. It's still the norm that the man is out working and the woman takes care of the home. And that's the norm for the world as a whole. So we shouldn't look at these abnormal circumstances and make them the criterion for what's right and wrong with regards to, you know, witnessing, etc. The other point that's important to note is that in the area of a woman's speciality, for example, in the case of breastfeeding, where if a woman has breastfed yourself and your wife, she knows. If she, according to Islamic law, gives witness by herself that she breastfed both you and your wife as children, that is sufficient to annul your marriage. That is sufficient. Her single witness is enough to annul your marriage. So it's not across the board that it's only two men, because that's her area. Who best knows who breastfed you? So in that area, her single witness is sufficient. That was a new point you came across. You raised a very good issue about how the, uh, the men were unemployed by women coming in the market and so on, and that was exploitation in a manner. Just sidestepping from the issue of uh, women rights, you know, India is in a peculiar position now where a lot of jobs are outsourced cheap to India and people in the Europe and the America are rendered unemployed. Is that uh, exploitation in any manner or is there a problem with that as far as this Islamic opinion is concerned? Well, in general, uh, for a businessman to try to find, you know, the cheapest sources of labor for his product he's producing. This is his right to do so. Islam doesn't say you can't do that. But if it ultimately is harming his own society, you know, Islam does interfere to some degree in the business and economic functions of the society where harm takes place. You know, so it would step in if it saw, for example, that people were now, many were made unemployed, they weren't able to take care of their families, etc., etc. You know, then, then it would put some restrictions on the companies in order to protect the interests of the society as a whole, just as it prevents them from hoarding in order to artificially raise prices. It prevents them from doing that. It prevents them from selling um, products, you know, in, in a deceptive way. You know, you're deceiving your, your customers. Uh, just the whole approach to, to trade uh, would, would be different in that you're trying to give the best product to people as opposed to give them the worst product at the best price. You know, this is a kind of, I mean, how to be a successful businessman. You buy the cheapest product, fool the people into thinking it's best for them, and you get the maximum price. Then you will be the top, you know. And this is really what had an impact in places like Indonesia and West Africa with the spread of Islam in that the people were used to 
a, a certain form of trade, which is the normal deceptive mode, right? This is the nature of the businessman. To make his maximum profits, he has to fool you, right? He's not going to tell you if there are defects in his product. He's going to hide those defects. So he got a cheap product because it was defective, and he will sell it to you as if it was a normal product, so he can get his maximum profits. Mm -hmm. So what happened is that people from Hadramaut, etc., who were going to Indonesia and selling their products using these techniques, once they became Muslims, they changed. So Indonesians came across these same traders who were coming. They, they were now pointing out defects in their, in their um, products. You know, they would tell them, well, no, this is really not the best, and so and so, and this is really only valued at this. They were shocked. Why would you want to do this? You were losing profits to tell us the truth about these things. But they said, well, this is what Islam, this is what our religion tells us. So, of course, naturally, the people were curious to know, well, what kind of religion is this that tells you this? And this had a big impact, whether in West Africa or in, in Indonesia, which led to a lot of uh, conversions of people to Islam because they could see a different approach to uh, trade, etc. You know, there was trust here. The, the trader became a trustworthy individual instead of somebody you were you know, looking for to deceive you, mm -hmm. you know.